uh, welcome and um, to this fourth uh, um, uh, episode in our uh, pig farming uh, series and so on. If you've missed the first three, um, go to our YouTube channel, uh, Training for Farmers uh, um, uh, YouTube channel, and um, yeah, and then catch up with what we've done so far. Now, today we're doing uh, pig manure um, asset or liability. Um, basically, can you turn it into money or is it just a big problem? Um, and this is, I must say, is one of my favorite topics um, and so on. I've always said, I think there's more money to be made in pig shit than in pigs, um, especially as the feed prices and costs are at the moment. But um, yeah, without any further ado, let's make a start. Uh, Stream. There we go. Okay, so um, yeah, we can either see. Uh, I, I went to a I went to a seminar once. It was all about recycling of waste and things like that. Long time ago, and the keynote speaker started off with saying, "Big man, sorry, he said uh, waste only exists between people's ears," and the audience was taken aback, what is this guy saying? Is he insulting us or what's he doing? But he took a, co a, a Coke bottle, a, coke, a liter of Coke out, and he asked, um, is this waste? And he said, no. And he yeah, took out the empty one and he said, is it waste now? And he said, yes. He said, what changed? The bottle didn't change. The, the, it, all that changed was your perception of it. So we're going to look at perceptions. Uh, we're going to try and change your perception today um, to see that pig manure is actually a valuable product and not just a problem. And um, yeah, it can actually mitigate some of your uh, problems that you have with smell and with uh, flies and, and things like that as well. So let's kick off. Okay, guys, please, if you find any use, uh, any uh, valuable information in the, seri in the series and so on, please subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything, but it makes it possible for us to keep on doing this free of charge. So uh, please subscribe. Also push the little bell button so that you get notifications that, yep, the, the next one is about to start. We do this every two weeks um, and so on, but you'll get notifications if you forgot uh, on a Sunday afternoon sleeping in and so on. So yeah, please subscribe and um, on the video, if you're on the video, if you're not uh, on the live uh, show, then um, please um, look at, um, at the, just in the right bo bottom right hand corner, you'll see the little subscribe button. You don't even have to go out of the video, just click it there. Okay. So let's move on. Oops. So guys, today we're going to look at firstly raw manure as it comes out of the source and um, after it's been composted, aerobic composting um, and so on. We're going to uh, get to look at aerobic, aerobic composting. Then we're going to look at vermic composting that with earthworms, specifically Ansenia uh, cheetah or the tiger worm or the red wriggler. There's a whole lot of different um, local names for it and so on. But it's a composting worm that lives in the compost. There's other worms that eat organic material, but they live in the soil and they sort of nibble at the edges of the, of, of the, of the organic material. But uh, the, red, uh, the, the tiger worm or the um, Ansenia futida lives in the manure itself. It's got a very high tolerance for a whole lot of different um, uh, things, the temperature and uh, acidity and all of those kind of things. We're also going to look at what you can do with uh, with your manure uh, to, uh, related to biogas uh, and so on, which is an anaerobic um, fermentation process and so on that produces uh, methane, and we can do with that. And lastly, we're going to look at uh, also composting. All of these things leave you with compost at the end as an end product. Okay, there's worms as an additional product. There is um, the compost for sale as an additional product. There's biogas as an additional pro product, but the, all of them leave with compost. The black soldier flies leave you with a, a, a larvae in its final stages um, that are trying to overwinter or get, uh, uh, um, get, uh, survive uh, uh, the, the next or unfavorable conditions. The, the, the larvae is about as big as my 
uh, last digit of my small finger, um, and so on. And um, the, oh, sorry, the screen froze, and uh, I'm not sure whether it's freezing for you as well. But yeah, it's, it's quite a big uh, larvae, and we're going to have a look at that as well. Okay. So guys, let's look at compost versus manure. So as we all know, manure is smelly and our neighbors complain about it and, and so on. Uh, it's also usually wet. Um, so it, it's liquid after we've washed it out and so on. It's hard, it's heavy because you're carting with wet material. And of course, water weighs a kilo per liter and so on. And it's hard to handle. You can't pick it up easily. Um, it's also, it increases the volume of it. Um, which yet now you've got to transport more of it. Um, it all, can also carry pathogens and weed seeds and so on. And one of the big selling points of pig manure bedding compost or spent bedding compost is that it, you can guarantee it weed free, which is a huge uh, advantage if you're selling compost because if you take crawl manure and put it in your garden for the next seven years you are going to be weeding your your vegetable beds because those seeds don't all come um they all that they've got dormancy which means they all don't germinate at the same time for survival of the species uh, and so on but you're going to be weeding for the next seven years uh, and so on so that's a big uh, selling point and then your, your raw manure is also your breeding ground of the flies guys 85 percent of the population lives in the manure. The adults that you see is 15% of the total population, but we'll talk more about that. And then the, you, you lose nutrients with, uh, um, uh, so the nitrogen, nitrogen is a very funny substance. It, it's only a liquid at minus 174 degrees Celsius or something like that. Yet like uh, if you ever did AI and you look at liquid nitrogen and so on um, that you use in AI to freeze semen, that's the only way it's in, uh, it's in liquid. So it usually goes from a solid to a gas. So we lose a lot of nitrogen into the atmosphere where it came from originally. 78% of the air around you is nitrogen, but it's not in the form that plants can eat. Okay, so compost on the other hand, it's much less offensive. If you use sawdust as, as your bedding, even straw and so on, it smells like a pine forest. It's sort of musty. If you ever walked under a thick forest in Neisner or in the rainforest and so on, that musky smell of, of the forest, that's what it smells like. It does not smell like pig poos uh, and so on. Also, with your compost, the, the, the one big thing that it brings is it absorbs or it sucks up moisture. So now you've got a semi-solid, which you can scoop up in a, in a spade and put into a wheelbarrow and so on. And um, so it's, it's less water and so it then creates heat when you start composting it. And of course, you because of the extreme heat that goes up to 70 degrees Celsius, you need to add more water to it. But you can use your wastewater. Um, well, we'll discuss that a bit later. Then, so you, your solids, uh, handling manure as a solid on a small piggery, I'm not talk, talking 600 and 500 sow units and so on. But if you've got 20, 30, 40, even 50 sows, um, handling it as a, as a solid is much easier. Then, uh, of course, the, the, the volume, if you, when you mix it with uh, pig manure and the sawdust, um, it holds its volume, which is a good thing if you're selling compost. But if you straw, if you start with two cubic meters, by the time it's finally uh, yet ready to sell, it will reduce in volume by about half. But um, yeah, as I said, sawdust does not shrink. It does not uh, it, uh, disappear uh, on you and so on. So that could be an advantage or disadvantage, depending on what you want to do with the end product. And then, yeah, as I said, the, the temperatures in your compost goes up to 70 degrees Celsius. Now, that's hotter than your hot water cylinder. A uh, house's hot water cylinder, they usually set at 60 degrees, and but you're not going to run a, a bath of hot water and climb into it. It's going to burn the heck out of you. So 70 degrees is well with that. I've stuck my hand in sort of up to the end of my wrist, and um, I couldn't keep it there for more than a second without it burning uh, badly. And so on. <clears throat> okay, so also the nitrogen is is, uh, uh, is less, uh, but more st in a more stable form. As I said, seventy eight percent of the of the atmosphere is nitrogen, but is not in a form that that plants can eat. 
So um, after being composted, there's less nitrogen, but the nitrogen that's in there is in the form that plants can utilize and so on. Then uh, if you have a fly problem, um, that temperature, 70 degrees, fries them. So they either clot and the birds uh, pick them up or they just cook to death and so on. In the mornings, if I get to my piggery, it's like a, 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 a cloud of birds taking off when people arrive first thing in the morning. In the evenings, the guinea fowls are, guinea fowl is about 50 of them that come to the manure pile to come and eat the larvae of the, of the flies that's trying to escape the heat in the, in the, in the compost heap and so on. <clears throat> so yeah, nutrients are more stable. And uh, guys, the, the main thing in Botswana, we've got well big part of, of you know, of the central Kalahari, if you want to call it that. Uh, but it's sandy. It's either sandy or rocky or heavy clay. But all of those lack one thing, and that is organic material. Organic material holds moisture in the ground. It makes better root penetration, better water penetration, so it doesn't just run off the clay. And in the sand, it just doesn't go 50 foot down to, to the water table. The organic material is the stuff that holds the water in the soil. So compost, definitely a huge upgrade from, um, from raw. Okay, so we said that um, most nutrients um, or plants can only take up nutrients if they are an inorganic mineralized uh, and so on. But uh, most of the uh, potassium, the K in animal manure, is in an inorganic form, so it's highly available. Now, uh, K is very important if you're planting cabbages and so on, because it form, uh, it's, uh, it's got a huge influence on head forming of your cabbages and so on. So, the, and, and of the NPK, the, the K is the highest in pig manure. We'll have a look at the uh, distribution or, or the, at the, the quantities of these things uh, just now as well. The N and P, of course, is more in an organic form, which means it needs to be mineralized, bef uh, min mineralized before it can be utilized by plants, and that takes time. What happens then is that the N and the P isn't available like like a um, fertilizer you buy in the store and so on. You throw it out, and it's a big dump of N and, and P, and tomorrow it's gone. Uh, and so on. So it's slow releases as and when the plants can utilize it. So it's, it's a slow release, which is a, a much more um, uh, fertile or um, advan advantageous uh, way of doing it. Um, okay, but yeah, as I said, um, the, 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 the NP, uh, K and levels and so on in, in, um, in, in uh, uh, compost is, is high, in you know, pig manure is high, uh, and so on, but it's also got sulfur and zinc and calcium, magnesium, all the trace elements and macro elements like calcium and magnesium as well, um, that I know because we add a, a hell of a lot of uh, dicalcium phosphate. So phosphate and calcium, of course, those things are uh, in there a lot. Uh, the calcium also helps with the pH regulation and so on. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's apart from the nutrients, it also builds up the soil structure um, in, in your gardens or veggie gardens. Okay, um, yeah, so we said apart from the nutrients, it also builds up the soil structure, the water capacity um, and the biological activity, the earthworms and the uh, insects and things in the soil that break down um, the organic material also releases nutrients and make it available to the plants and so on. Um, it also uh, it slows down erosion and uh, leaching of nutrients and all of those good things um, that um, that the compost do apart from just the nutrients that it's supplying. Uh, okay, so we said that you know, so the compost adds, or the manure and the compost and the, the bedding adds carbon to the soil. Now, we all know, we've all heard about uh, um, the, the global warming and uh, carbon sequestration, sequestration, and, uh, sequestration and so on. Um, and, but they reckon that you can plant forests and all those things, but if the, every acre of the earth that is currently, just the currently used, utilized uh, uh, land that is being cultivated, if though that land can raise its carbon content by 1%, it 
then global warming is gone overnight, just by 1%. Get a cover crop, that if you're adding compost, you're doing that already, but if you, you can do green fertilizer, you plant a legume, you plow it in, and it builds up organic material in the soil. But um, yeah, so it also it holds water and uh, it, it gives you uh, money in your, in your pocket as well. Okay, so here's an analysis that I got of an Australian publication. So they've taken a pig manure that all, bedding from pigs, um, different kinds of bedding. Uh, so they used rice hulls. Um, here in Botswana, they even use uh, um, the, the hulls from, from sunflower, which is absolutely bloody useless because it does not absorb any moisture. And that's the one of the main things I want from a bedding material to give the, the pigs a, a drier uh, something to lie on. Um, but uh, yeah, so straw and rice hulls and mixtures of it. But uh, looking at the sawdust as the, the bedding material uh, plus the manure, uh, obviously, and so on. So the, the, it comes out at about 60% dry matter, so 40% uh, um, moisture, which if you throw it in a big heap, it will sort of flow like lava because of the weight as you pile it up higher and so on, but it doesn't run away like water. So, it, of course, if you take it and you squeeze it, you'll be able to squeeze get quite a few drops of water from it. That's 60% dry matter. But looking at the total nitrogen, uh, they reckon that the mixture of bedding and manure has got 9% nitrogen per, uh, per ton of, uh, sorry, 9 kilos of, of nitrogen per ton of dry matter. Uh, 10 kilos of, uh, um, uh, of, of uh, sorry, uh, phosphate and 18 kilos of uh, uh, potassium, okay. Um, yeah, why is potassium a K and not a P? Because P is taken with phosphate and so on. So potassium, another name for it is kalium. So that's where the K, K comes from. So what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to put a, a, a value, uh, so Botswana prices and so on, for what we're paying for a kilogram of N if we're buying it as urea and a, a kilogram of P as if you buy it as a super phosphate and a kilogram of K if we buy it as, as a, a potassium uh, uh, chloride, no, no, potassium, um, uh, yeah, kind of, uh, in an uh, inorganic fertilizer and so on. Okay, and, and then of course, if you know what's in there and you know what, the plants take out of us out of your soil. Then you know how much to how much of the manure to put into your uh, uh, field to make your to get a proper um, uh, production and so on. So this works like this: if you planting uh, with maize, we planting maize silage. Um, the, it takes out uh, per per hectare. Or, or, Take, sorry, per ton of uh, maize silage, it will take out 22 kilograms of nitrogen. It will take three uh, kilograms of phosphate and 20 kilograms of potassium. And uh, that will uh, take, uh, so if you uh, pr produce 10 tons per hectare, then uh, it, it means that you are going to need 220 kilograms of N. If you want 25 uh, tons per hectare, then of course you've got to give it more nitrogen, then you're giving it 550 kilograms of nitrogen. So that's N, not, not compost, but the, the N value of, of the compost and so on. So we can look at it, okay, I haven't got much uh, veggies here, apart from rice and, and so on, cowpeas and, and so on, but um, yet you can find these tables for a vegetable crop and, and work out exactly how much of this uh, um, compost you need to add to get a certain level of production. Oops, sorry. Okay, so uh, in Botswana, we pay uh, 390 pull up per, for a 50 kilogram bag, and there's 46 percent uh, nitrogen in it, or 460 grams per kilogram of nitrogen in it, and so on. Uh, potassium sulfate, we pay uh, 670 kilogram for a 50, uh, uh, so 760 for a 50 kilogram bag, and there is only 53 percent potassium in the bag. Superphosphate, 65 per 50 kilogram bag, and there's 10 percent P in that. So if you if you crunch the numbers and so on, 
per kilogram of phosphate, um, it is uh, phosphate is worth 73 pula per kilogram. Uh, the same for, for nitrogen, it is worth 16 pula 95 per kilogram of N. And, and, and the potassium, 25 kilograms, uh, pula per kilogram of potassium. So if you add those things up in a ton, um, a, a, a ton of, of compost is worth in nutrient replacement value of uh, 1,337 pula. Of course, you've got costs to that. So uh, that I sell a 60 liter bag, you don't sell compost by the weight because if it's wet, it weighs a ton, and if it's dry, it weighs nothing. Uh, you sell it by volume. So I sell a 60 liter uh, bag, old feed bag. I take a 20 liter bucket with three of those in the bag, and I sell that for 50 pula. So that works out to 2,500 pula per ton. Um, but I've got to buy the sawdust, and I pay about 200 pula for 1,000 liters of, of sawdust. And so that works out to about uh, uh, 600 pula for, for the, the, the sawdust component of the compost. So, um, um, that, so that it's 25 divided by 600 is, is sort of 1,800. Um, the fertilizer value is 1,370. So I'm sort of scoring a bit. But yet if you buy compost, you that extra value is in the building up of your soil uh, with organic matter and so on. So... It is, it's got a, a dollar value in nutrients to it that you can calculate. Okay, so the, the bottom left and the bottom right-hand corner pictures are of my piggery. Uh, the left one was just when I started sort of four years ago making it. You can see there's a sprinkler at the top that I wet it because uh, if you look at that top middle picture and so on, in the mornings or on a cold morning, especially when you've just turned it, the steam bellows out of it. It's, it's, so when it's steaming, of course, it's losing moisture and you've got to add moisture to it. Otherwise, the process stopped uh, and so on. So you've got to add moisture to it to keep the process going. So the EPR on the right-hand corner um, is uh, it's about 50 meters long. And um, me and my business partner jumped in there and turned uh, sort of up to halfway but because I wanted to see what's in the middle and so on. So, guys, what's happening here is that um, the, the outside bit gets enough oxygen. When you've turned it, it's got, it can breathe, it needs oxygen, and it needs moisture. Otherwise, it stops. So the outside bit of the heap uh, breathes and so on, but the inside bit gets enough oxygen. So it sort of once the outside bit has used up all the oxygen, the process stopped. Then you've got to aerate it. You've got to turn it again. So when we turn it, we would scoop the outside layer and throw it on the ground first. And so when we get to the middle, that goes on top. So we're actually turning the heap inside out, not just moving it one meter to the left. It, uh, so all you want to do is pick it up and throw it one meter to the left. We do that with two guys with a shovel on each side. And that uh, was sort of about 20 meters and so on. We did that in just under well, about a half an hour between the two of us. So it can be done by hand. Of course, uh, in a, a big industrial setup, like on the top left-hand corner there, they've got machines doing that uh, and so on. But um, guys, it is worth good money. Um, and... Um, and if you if you utilize it for your own vegetable production, you're actually getting more than selling the compost and so on. Um, it, it's, it's more worth to you if you turn it into vegetables than to selling it by, by the bag. Okay, so um, at my piggery, uh, we, we, we pick up the, the, the bedding and, and the poos by spade and into a wheelbarrow and we put it in the compost heaps. But there's always a little bit left. We wash that out. It runs uh, through an open drain, like at the bottom right-hand corner. So the, the two pictures on the right is my piggery. That's my sump uh, where the, eff the effluent goes into, or the liquid. And so it runs into that first chamber uh, on the top picture in the right-hand side. It runs into there. Then it overflows into the front um, on the left, um, and then overflows to the, uh, the one on the far end, and then out to a, a, a earth uh, sedimentation uh, area in the, in the, on the ground and so on. But guys, the, uh, with other, other ways of doing it is on a bigger scale, uh, if you look at the other two pictures there, the big bunkers, 
Uh, but the same thing, the, the guys, the, the good thing about pick poos is it's got the good sense of sinking. Uh, cow poo and, uh, and so on floats. If you go to an effluent pond on a dairy farm, you'll see there's about a foot thick crust. You can actually walk on it uh, because the fiber, the methane lifts, it binds to the fiber, lifts it up and it floats on top. Pig manure sinks and we use that to separate most of the solids out of the manure to, in, to get rid of some of the water and uh, handle it again as, as a semi-dry material. So as it goes into the next uh, uh, compartment, further on, you can look at that picture in the middle top. Um, you can see the, the organic, or the, the solid spot gets less and less and more, uh, a bigger percentage of it turns into it is, is just brown water then and so on. Okay, so right in the beginning, in the first year that I was here, I came in February so, and it was a drought year. We didn't get any rain. We got rain a little bit on New Year's Day, and we got some on my birthday on the 8th of April. Instead of the, dry, uh, the, the rainy season, we got absolutely nothing, So and, and we had a few pigs. So I started with three, uh, three drum compartments, and it worked well for the first year until our numbers picked up and the rainy season came, and then, of course, it flooded out. So then we built a bigger, bigger concrete one that we just looked at. But when we cleaned those drums out the first time, guys, number one there, so this, that's where the, the effluent runs in first. The stuff that came out there was a bit like oats porridge. So it's sort of coarser material. You can look at a thick picture there. It sort of looks like, well, it looks like sawdust and, and uh, husks of the uh, maize and uh, things like that. But it's it sort of got a, a crumbly, coarse texture. The second compartment um, where, so it sinks, where the solids sink out, so then it overflows into the second compartment. That compartment, the stuff that came out there was like, like an oil slick. It's very fine particles, and it, if you've rubbed it in between your fingers, it felt like a thick, smooth oil slick, so, uh, and so on. It's the best I can come up with a description. The third uh, compartment, guys, was just brown water and that we pumped uh, i have a little submersible pump uh, that runs off a, a tractor battery and we pump that to uh, wet the, the compost heaps but it comes out as water so we can separate a, quite a bit of the solids off and put that when when you clean that out eventually you put it back in the compost as well so you, you're not losing any of your nutrients you're capturing it to yeah, make your compost better The second way, and, and I did this, you see that picture in the bottom right-hand corner, that's a three, uh, well, three uh, uh, compartments. At the bottom is a tank, at the top is a lid, and it's a, it's a household worm composting bin. And I designed that, and we got a, a, a grant from the government in New Zealand uh, to uh, make the mold, and we sold those, and we farmed earthworms to stock these bins. We sold those worms for uh, $25, New Zealand dollars. So the conversion rate at the moment is eight um, pula for a dollar, New Zealand dollar. So, um, to, to, so it's 100 pula, sorry, 100 dollars a kilogram. We sold it in 250 grams to stock one of those bins and so on. And um, yeah, so the, the worms itself is valuable. And of course, they ate pig manure in those bins. Uh, but of course, yeah, that's all right for for your uh, vegetable peelings in your kitchen, and um, a bit of paper and tissues. Those kind of things can all go in there. Your tea tea bags and all of those kind of things can go into a small thing like that. But when you've got a piggery and you need to move large volumes, then you can do uh, systems like the bottom two uh, other two pictures at the bottom, where you can do it on a bigger scale. Now you don't need to cover it with. Uh, um, you need to cover it, but you need to let water through. So old, the old Hessian underlay from carpets, these days it's a, it's a sort of a synthetic material. The old days were the best when they ripped those out to put new carpets in. I used to pick, pick those up from the carpet companies and put that over my, my uh, compost on. And um, so you want water to go through, of course, to keep them moistly, moist. But for the earthworms, 
their bedding needs to be, if you take a handful and you squeeze as hard as you can, there must just be a little droplet forming at the bottom of your fist. That is uh, the moisture content they want. They don't want the drier or wetter than that. Uh, but so you need to add water. So don't cut the rain off with a, with a waterproof uh, covering and so on. Or you can just put shade cloth. Of course, the worms do not like sunlight. And that's how we separate them from the compost. When we want to sell the worms, we make little pyramids. Um, there's sort of six or eight around the table. And then in a, on a bright sunny day, then we take um, sort of the outside inch off, throw it in, in, a, in a different container, and then they dig. Now you've exposed them to, to sunlight again, and then they dig deeper in. And you keep on taking the outside off until you, with a little bundle of wriggling worms right at the bottom of that pile. But you keep on going around the table to do one, do next. So you keep on going in a circle and you end up with uh, the kilo or so of, of worms at the bottom of it. Now, uh, of course, uh, these uh, worms are um, uh, bisexual. They, well, they, they are hermaphrodites, so they've got male and female uh, parts, but they cannot fertilize themselves. So the two um, uh, worms um, comb that's sort of, uh, not together like that, and they swap semen from one to the other, and, and, um, and then they form like a thick jelly around that uh, part where the, where the eggs was exchanged, and then they move out of that jelly, and it leaves behind a little capsule. Looks like a little grain of rice. It is um, sort of yellow uh, when it's fresh, turns darker and darker, and after it's hatched, it's sort of uh, black. In that capsule, there's between 2 and 20, but sort of average 5, 6 little worms, and they grow up. Now, these worms, um, the, the, uh, botan or the biological name is Ansenia futida. Futida as in fetid. Fetid means stinky, shitty, smelly. Uh, 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 so they produce a chemical that uh, if you hurt them, if you squeeze them like that, they, there's a, 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 a droplet of this yellow fluid that comes out. And it's uh, if you were a predator, if you're trying to eat it, then it would um, be very unpalatable and it spit you out. My son had an axolot. Uh, it's a sort of like a lizard, but it's got gills and it can live under the water, but it's got to come up to breathe and it eats earthworms. And anyway, we threw one of these worms in the tank and he grabbed it, and then he went, Poo! He spit it out as if he's disgusted. Ah, jeez, what are you feeding me now? I hated the taste of it, and so on. So birds and things don't eat them, uh, and so on. So you don't have to worry about birds eating all your worms, and so on. But guys, the thing is about worms, uh, composting, uh, it adds value. Now, uh, what I did with the compost, and so on, after I've taken the worms out, I made it into a tea. I put 20 liters or 20 liter volume of that vermicast in a 200 liter drum, filled it up with water, stirred it, then poured it through a sieve. So all this coarser bits I just put back into the uh, heaps and so on. Now I've got a, a, a dark brown liquid. I put it in two liter milk bottles, took it to the farm, uh, the, the farm uh, vegetable day on Saturdays and um, sold it for $2 per two liters. But in that two liters of, of uh, worm tea, there was only 200 grams of actual compost. Now, if you convert that to dollar per, uh, the dollars or the value of one cubic meat cost, it's 5,000 New Zealand dollars per cubic meter of vermicast. So it's a huge value adding tool because you only use even that 20% people would dilute before they put it on their, their household uh, plants in the house and so on, or their vegetables. But so the, comp the vermicast is worth money. And as I said, the worms is worth uh, 100 New Zealand dollars per kilogram as well. And what do they eat? Of course, your pig manure and so on. The first time I heard about worms, um, I was managing the pig research unit at Massey University in New Zealand. The guy pulled up with a bucky and, a, and a, a trailer and he said, I want some pig shit. And I said, what? What do you want to do with pig shit? He said, no, I'm growing worms. And that was that was the it for me. I, I was, we did it in a big way, um, me and a business partner, and we made good money out of worms um, and so on. So I've <laughs> done a few things in my life.
and, and that was one of it. The next thing is uh, that we're looking at is the black soldier fly. Now, guys, these things look like small wasps rather than a fly, and they do that for a reason to get, discourage uh, birds and, and uh, things eating them. So they look like a wasp. They look like they're dangerous, but they're not. Now, guys, these things are very special animals. Firstly, they when they are adult, they only live for about a week. In that week, they don't eat anything. They don't. They do not even have mouth parts. They don't have mandibles, chewing parts in their mouth. They do not drink, uh, eat. They do suck water, or uh, that if you feed them a higher sugar or higher protein, milk and so on, they live for two weeks instead of one week. In that week, they mate and they lay thousands of eggs. Uh, per, per laying, they lay sort of 500 to 900 eggs. And within a month, that egg, which is, is, is like an uh, eighth of, of a rice uh, 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 kernel, um, turns into a larvae the size of my finger's uh, last um, digit there. So uh, uh, yeah, they grow very fast. And again, what do they eat? They eat your big shit and so on. Of course, you've got to breed them uh, and so on. To do that, you put them in a cage um, covered by a fly screen or shade net and so on. Um, so you need some, you buy the larvae. Then you uh, put them in some bedding inside the cage. They hatch into flies. The flies mate and lay more eggs. Now, they don't like, like laying the eggs in the food. They like laying it in little space. Put a corrugated cardboard box, strips of it in, like the top left-hand picture. And they lay, lay the eggs there. Then you have cardboard, you put it into a growing medium, and then they grow and they get bigger and so on. And uh, you, you end up with these larvae and so on. They're about an inch long um, and sort of five millimeters thick. And they have got 40% protein and 30% fat. Now, guys, fat hasn't got a lot of water. Of course, protein has uh, and so on. But... As a whole, they dry very easily because they don't have a lot of moisture in total. So if you put them out on a, on a corrugated iron sheet on a hot African summer, summer's day, by this afternoon they are crispy dry and you can get mill them or whatever. So your chickens love them, fish love them. If you mold it into a powder, uh, pigs will eat it, absolutely no problem. Very high in protein, very high in fat. So fat, remember fat? has got two and a quarter times more energy in a kilogram of fat than there is in a kilogram of carbohydrates, my, uh, any other carbohydrate. So high energy, high protein uh, feed that you can make from it. Now, when they get into that last stage, before they fall, so they, uh, they're still in a, in a larva stage, and then they start forming a pupa. In the final stages of pupa, they do not want to be in the food anymore. They've grown. They're as big as they're going to get. They want to overwinter. They want to get out of the food. So they harvest themselves. Remember I always said we have to harvest the worms. It is labor intensive. These things harvest themselves. So if you if you look at that picture in the bottom right-hand corner, but if you make that now get 100 meters long instead of a little box like that, you put the food in the bottom. When they get to the right stage, they climb up the 45-degree angles on the side and they fall in a canal or a pipe like that and they fall in the bucket at the bottom. So they harvest themselves. You don't have to harvest them. And it gives you chicken food, fish, pig food, um, if you and, of course, the compost at the end of it. So you're still getting compost, but you're also getting food out of it uh, and so on. They like hot I did this in New Zealand, um, but New Zealand is a lot colder than here, and I struggled. I made uh, movable uh, breeding cages out of 200-litre uh, drums with netting around it so that I can move them to sunny spots as the sun moves and so on. But even then, it was too cold for them. But here in Africa, at 35, 40 degrees is absolutely perfect for them. They, they love it, and they breed. Um, now, I just want to show you. I wonder if this is going to work on here. Um, yeah, uh, no, it's not. Sorry, I wanted to show you a little. Um, they, they they put two fish in uh, uh, well in, in sort of a, a, a bucket with um, 
with two fish in it. And in about 10 minutes, they strip it so that there's just bones left. Get back there. Um, and um, yeah, so they've got teeth. The, the, the larvae and the maggots have got teeth. So they, the, the, the earthworms have to wait till uh, the, 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 the cabbage leaf that you threw in there is rotten and it's slushy and they can suck it up. These things got, got teeth. They can eat a fish to the bone in, in, in a short uh, time. So they can make compost or they can process organic matter much faster to give you compost and then the, the, the high protein, high energy larvae that you're after and so on. So, guys, there's, there's a lot of things we can do with our... So, yeah, yeah basically, if you're doing a, a canal, concrete canal with a gutter at the top to catch them, they climb up and they fall in a bucket and you feed it to your fish or your pigs or your chickens and so on. Now, we've got one... one of, uh, the, this bottom left-hand corner picture is, is uh, when our one was being built. Um, so, it's a, quite a big one. My business partner... Uh, seven foot, he stands in there, that middle round ball thing. He, he can stand up straight there without his head touching the top. So it's, it's, a, it's a big uh, thing under the ground, uh, a, a gas chamber. And, of course, you're feeding it um, on the one end, the compost. As, but once it's full, if you add something, something goes out on the other end. And, of course, that is uh, then compost, uh, liquid uh, compost coming out the other end. But the, the byproduct is methane gas. Now, that methane gas, um, our laborer's uh, cottage uh, on the farm, uh, the gas goes, uh, he's got, you know, like those gas lamps with a little white bag thingy that glows. He's got lighting from methane gas. He's got, it goes through a cooker, get a normal gas cooker like you would have in your kitchen and so on. All you have to do is you've got to drill the little hole from the burners just a little bit bigger because the, the, the methane gas or the, the biogas that comes out of here is 65% methane, but it's got also got 35% carbon dioxide, which does not burn. So it, it's concentrated. You can put that through uh, uh, scrubbers to take some of that carbon dioxide out, which makes it more pure uh, methane. But even with that biogas, you can cook, you can have lighting, uh, you can even run a... a, 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 a petrol generator from it. The problem is there's also a, a little bit of sulfur in the biogas and that eats up the metal of your, your thing and it rusts to bits in, in a year and so on, unless you've scrubbed it. And we'll have a look at scrubbers just now uh, and so on. But um, uh, we actually here on the farm, um, we've turned our petrol generator. Okay, we don't run it on methane. We run it on uh, normal LPG gas that you get from it in, in canisters and so on. All we do is we, we take the, the, the uh, they, for, for pollution wise, they, they take the, the exhaust gases and they put it through, uh, through the, the system again. And we pull that little pipe out, connect the gas in there, and uh, put on petrol, then turn it into gas. And then the, the generator runs on normal gas from a cylinder and so on. So you can do the same with, with, uh, with your uh, methane gas. So these are, but guys, these things are huge, they're expensive, you've got to dig a hole, you've got to build this thing in a circle, which is not easy, uh, and so on. But um, that's one way of doing it. Now, even that size is nowhere near enough, even for a 25 South Pigri. They, they reckon that a 25 South Pigri can run a, a small town in uh, its needs in biogas, and so on. So they actually, we were feeding this, uh, our, our one with cow manure from, from our cows and not the pigs. But it could be done, put it that way. Okay, now the other way to do it, which you don't have to dig a big hole and so on, okay, smaller uh, quantities and so on, but it can still produce enough uh, gas to, to, to run a generator, to produce uh, electricity, to heat your piglets um, or uh, get your, your neighbors' houses and so on. So these are IBCs, uh, international bulk containers, a thousand liters, uh, and so on. You need to paint them black because, I said uh, uh, again, your biogas thing is also the bet. The hotter, the better. The, the hotter it is, the better, uh, uh, faster it works, um, and so on. That's why you need to plant uh, paint it black because we know all know that 
black cars is a lot hotter inside than a white car um, and so on. But um, uh, so with this one on the left, the, the, the gas gets tapped off and it gets caught up um, in, in, um, in tubes and so on. The one on the right is a floating chamber. So it's two of those. So you put the one crate on top so that the, the top one doesn't fall around. But the, the, these things actually, two of them fit inside each other. So the bottom one has got the top cut off. The top one is upside down with its with its top, top cut off as well, upside down. So the, the opening is the bottom. So the bottom one is filled with your biomass, your pig manure, or your, or your cow and water mixture. And as the gas form, it pushes the top one up to, until you've got a cubic meter of it, and then you tap it off. And you can uh, use a, gen, a, a compressor and pump it into a tire. You can carry that tire a kilometer into the felt there with your generator, and you can run a generator and weld or whatever you want to do out there without any electricity um, uh, and so on, and without any petrol usage. So, guys, bio, biogas is is a, a very viable option uh, and so on. Yet here in Botswana, um, we don't have any um, electricity at our piggery. We use hot boxes and so on, which we will look at uh, in another uh, show and so on. But if you've got biogas, you can make heat, you can uh, heat up your piggy, piggies and so on. Okay, so guys, please subscribe. If you found anything useful out of this video, uh, please push that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything, uh, but it makes us uh, it makes it possible for us to to keep on doing this.